Fighter pilots debrief everything. Every mission is followed by a debrief where we analyze the behavior of the formation. What did we see? What did we do? How did we behave in the environment that we were in? If you're running a high performance team, you'll be debriefing execution as well. What I'll do today is play you a short video of me simulating a fighter mission debrief and then afterwards I'll point out some of the key techniques that we used to focus on behavior, not outcome, and to create very high levels of psychological safety within our environment. So let's have a look at the video now. Okay, welcome Shogun Warlock, a debrief for us today. Our mission aim was to get 100% of the strikers over the target during the TOT window. The objectives I set to achieve that were firstly effective coordination with the strike package, secondly effective escort, and thirdly flawless fighter basics. Firstly, any questions from the brief? No. Any safety issues? Shogun 2. Okay, and that was on the egress flow? Okay. So we have, uh, we'll have a look at that in our pairs debrief. Uh, anything further for safety? Okay, domestics, uh, was SOP going out? Any questions going out? Any points to bring up? Domestics coming back. Warlock 4 uh, looked a little bit long as uh, Warlock 3 approached, approached the base turn point. How did you assess the spacing? Okay, what about the pitch timing? Okay, so as Warlock 3 pitches, be, you've got to be ready for that and just count that two seconds so that we pitch at two seconds to give us that nice 2,000 feet as we approach the base turn point. Uh, any domestic air, uh, issues in the area? Uh, with GCI, anything else? Okay. Uh, limiting factors, Shogun 2 had uh, only one chaff bucket firing today, so he was down on chaff. Any other limiting factors? Okay. Uh, so ingress flow, our initial posture, we have Shogun Warlock with the strike package marshalling about 20 miles behind us and there's one uh, heavy group being called uh, Bullseye 360 at 20. Uh okay, so Shogun 1 and 2 uh, roll into that northern group. There's a pair scene and there's two times Fox 3 kills uh, assessed as valid in that northern group. Warlock 3, uh, what do you see out of that southern group? Okay, he's a bit further to the south. Okay, so you sort into that, into that southern group, and how does that uh, prosecution go? Okay, so we get one Fox 3 kill, and one leaker who is then sent to Zack to the east, is that correct? Okay. Uh, from Warlock 4, what do you see when you roll into that group? Okay, so it looks like we may have had uh, both shooting at the same uh, aircraft there. So that's something to have a look at for Warlock, is the radar work as we go into uh, that part of the intercept. At this stage, we get left with one single hostile dragging to the east, then northeast. Uh, we've elected, Shogun 1 and 2 have elected to uh, push over to the east to try and uh, maintain situational awareness on that threat and Warlock 3 and 4 are now sanitizing the target area by tracking north um, and at this point our strike package has come over the target area. So at this stage I would assess that We've got pretty good SA on, on the threats in the target area and we've managed to clear that target area and providing good sanitization for the strike package. Uh, we just have to have a look at the radar work uh, and how this intercept goes with the southeastern group to see that if there was something in there that we could have done uh, to uh, basically um, to kill all of those threats in that southeastern group. So how did we go today? Um, 
our objectives. We wanted effective co-op with the strike package. I think we, we did provide that. GCI was quite useful for them as well. We managed to get them over the target area without uh, them being threatened. Uh, during the TOT windows, so that, that's been pretty good. Secondly, effective escort. I think we did a reasonable job with both prosecuting the threats as we could see it, uh, and then sanitizing the airspace after uh, to provide a safe passage for the strikers. And thirdly, flawless fighter basics. We probably were let down on that a little bit in a couple of areas, just with, uh, we've got a safety infringement uh, on the ingress, uh, sorry, the egress flow. And we have to have a look at the radar work of uh, Warlock three and four, just uh, as we prosecute that Southeastern group. But overall, uh, we did get 100% of the strikers over the target during the TOT window. Uh, so well done today, guys. And we'll now split up for our individual element debrief. Okay, at the start of the debrief, you can see that I restated the aim. The aim is the desirable outcome we want to achieve. Every high performance team has desirable outcomes, but I'm a huge believer that we need to focus on behavior and design our team's behavior that in the absence of external circumstances that we can't control, then that behavior would achieve the aim. So our objectives today are behavioral objectives. We can control everything to achieve those objectives. If we achieve these objectives, if everything else goes well, then we should achieve the mission. But we can't control other things. We can't control one of the strike assets breaking and having to return to base. We can't control one of the strike assets not listening on the radio and, and, and making a stupid tactical decision. I can only control my formation's behavior and set objectives in accordance with those behavioral goals. So we wanted effective coordination, we wanted effective escort, and we wanted effective or flawless fighter basics. So if we do those things, we should achieve the mission. We then run through uh, any questions from the plan or from the brief, any safety issues. Uh, was there any domestics issues? In fighter squadrons, there's a very, very heavy reliance on standard operating procedures. And those of you who have been following me will know that I'm a huge believer in writing down everything that you or your team routinely does, calling that a procedure, and basically executing in accordance with that procedure, unless there's a good reason not to. And there's many, many good reasons for doing that. One of them is that I can now say, in the brief, the departure and the arrival is going to be standard op in accordance with standard operating procedures. That would take half an hour to brief alone if I didn't use those standard operating procedures as the framework to get the four aeroplanes out into the airspace and get them back. Also in the debrief, um, domestics, outback area, were there any things that happened on the way out that weren't in accordance with SOP? Were there anything that happened on the, on the return to base? Uh, and you saw me point out that one of the wingman had maybe um, delayed his turn into the circuit and his spacing wasn't quite right. And thirdly, was there any issues that happened out in the area? We go through any limiting factors. So are there any things that limited your jet today so that you then couldn't behave in accordance with our behavioral objectives? Um, in your organization, it may be that someone was sick or someone had an emergency and they had to leave work. In this case, it's problems that we have with our jet, problems with the radio, problems with the weapon systems. But we always ask, was there any limiting factors, any things that limited your uh, ability to behave in accordance with our objectives. We then review what happened and we cut this up into time slices. There's many ways to do this and in the example I covered the whole mission in about uh, a matter of minutes. That would normally take probably 30 minutes to break down everything that happened but for our example we went through that quite quickly and we saw that there was a couple of issues that we wanted to look at. Um, and, and then go into deeper and see if there's things that we could have done better. What you will have noticed inside when I was talking to the formation members is that I was using generally a third per party narrative, a third person narrative, and I was speaking to the people by their job title, or in my case, their call sign. So this is far less likely to be uh, perceived as a personal attack if I debrief using the call sign and I debrief objectively like I'm a, a third party describing what happened. 
also whenever to also contribute towards that level of trust and psychological safety I never say hey what you did wasn't good enough I always compare the behavior to the ideal behavior and, and this is why it's critical in high performance organizations that you have very very well documented solid values and behavioral standards for how you behave because then when you're talking to each other about how you can get better it's not like hey you need to be as good as me it's hey we need to be as good as what our organization stands for and it's much easier to accept criticism if you know you're trying to strive towards an aspirational set of standards as opposed to someone attacking you for not being as good as they think you should be or not being as good as them. So compare behavior to ideal organizational behavior, not to your behavior or, or someone else's behavior. We are all aspiring to act in accordance with our team's standards, our team's ideal behavior. We run through, we identify a couple of areas that we need to look at a bit more closely and what would typically happen is after the four aircraft debrief, we would then break off into individual two ship elements and the, the lead would then speak to his wingman about any issues that they had and look for any areas of weakness that they can pick up and improve upon next time. Okay, if you're looking to introduce a debriefing structure or a protocol inside your organization, there's a great acronym we can use which contains all the critical elements uh, for a good debrief. The acronym is ergo RAP, and the E stands for every. So we wanna debrief every important piece of execution that our team performs. We don't wanna leave anything, any opportunity for learning uncovered. The R is for review. So we wanna review what happened during the execution uh, and that's a matter of drawing out from your people what they saw, what they heard, their information. It may be that you have some kind of data capture that captures parts of the execution but you want to review what happened so everyone's got their story straight before we start to analyze what we could have done better. We then want to look at things that we did well and things that we didn't do well and in the Air Force we used to call these goods and others. Um, others is a little bit uh, nicer way than saying bad. So look at the things that you did well and acknowledge them and reinforce them and look at the things that you didn't do so well that next time you can improve on and identify them and capture them for further analysis later on. A very important part of the whole process of constant improvement is that we have to respond. So there's no point drawing a whole bunch of lessons out of our execution and then going on to a champagne lunch and moving on to the next project. We have to uh, work out what we're going to do so that those errors ideally never ever happen again. Now sometimes that's unrealistic but certainly we want to respond within our organization and within our own execution so that the chance of those errors happening again are limited. We want to then allocate responsibility. So don't walk away and say, yeah, we're going to change that procedure or we're going to fix that up without nailing someone down who has to deliver on that response at a certain time in a certain way. And lastly, we want to finish on a positive note. If you're in a really, really high performance team, uh, your team members will be used to getting critical feedback. They're hungry for that. That's what they're there for. Um, you can bet that the top performing sports people in the world don't spend a lot of time with their coach talking about what they do well. They are searching for weakness. But if you're introducing a debriefing protocol for the first time and you, and you have executed well, then you want to end on a positive. In a fighter squadron, we wouldn't dwell on positives very much because there just wasn't time and you'll find that in very high performing teams everywhere this is the case. We know we do most things pretty well, we're not interested in that, we're interested in what we can learn and improve and get better at. So if you think about it, ergo wrap has all the critical elements and I use them during my simulated uh, debrief video that you just watched. We, cover, we, we debrief the execution after the task, so we do that every time. We reviewed what happened. I used time slices to draw out of the formation and my own memory what actually occurred. 
We talked about the things that were good, so we summed that up at the end by saying, yeah, our, our uh, behavioral objectives, we, we kind of achieved two out of three of them. We identified that there was two areas that we needed to go in and, and have a look at a little more closely. We would then, in the element debrief, have worked out a response. Most of the time, there won't be a big organizational response for day-to-day -day execution errors. It'll be more like personal response that you have to take away and change something inside your own execution so that the chance of you making that error again in the future is reduced. Allocate responsibility if that's appropriate. So what do I need to do myself to make sure that never happens again? What am I gonna go and rehearse? What am I gonna do next time in my preparation for this execution to make sure that that never happens again? In your organization, it may be something like, okay, uh, the people in charge of logistics, the head of logistics needs to come back to the CFO and provide a brief or a change in procedure by Tuesday the 27th. But allocate responsibility and make sure those lessons don't get lost and don't get wasted. And lastly, end on a positive note. Even if it's been a bad day, there'll always be something inside that period of execution that was positive that you can draw out. So try and end on a, on a positive note. And remember, we are all aspiring to the organization's high standards. We are all gonna fall short but we're, we're all looking up to where we, we wanna be and we're all moving to that area. So try and end the debrief on a positive note. So overall, that's some of the techniques that fighter pilots would use inside our debriefs to help our organizational learn, to ensure that we're focused on behavior and to create very, very high levels of psychological safety. These things are all hallmarks of very high performance teams.